Father, we just thank God for his presence and being here with us today. And I'm telling y'all, I am encouraged today. I am really encouraged today because God is working some things in, in our lives. And all you need is spiritual eyes to look around you and see what God is doing with his people. I thank God for um, just bringing us through to this point. You know, if you get caught up listening to the world, you would think God is forsaken. But no, he hasn't. God is keeping his people. God is blessing his people. Here, there, and everywhere, God is yet in our midst. Amen? God is yet on the throne because he is keeping his people from this pandemic. Amen? And I told y'all they tried to say my wife had it. And she went to the doctor. That's not why she went. She went because her blood pressure was low. But when she was in the hospital, they're going to test her. Anybody go in there? So they tried to say she had it. So the dialysis unit was like, well, she can't come back here. She has to go to the COVID unit. So that week when they released her, which was the very next week, they got her blood pressure stabilized, but Mary had no other symptoms. They gave her her test, and the test came back negative at the dialysis unit. And then they said, well, we're going to have to wait another week to test it again. <laughs> wait another week, tested it again, it was still gone. So they called, well, everybody in the house, everybody been around, you got to go get it tested. Your husband, oh, yeah, he got to go get it tested. I went and got tested twice. I didn't have it. So that's why I tell people, don't ever tell a child of God what they do or do not have. Because if God is giving you his grace, if God is giving you his mercy, it doesn't matter. He said a thousand shall fall at thy side. Ten thousand at thy left, but it won't come nigh you. Amen? Amen. If you will, on this morning, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, just for this opportunity. Lord, to come before your people, Lord, and give them these words of inspiration and encouragement and strength, Lord. For Lord, you spoke to me on this week, Lord, and I begin to see your heart and how, Lord, you love your people so. But Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, because you are teaching us how to serve you, both in spirit and in truth. So we worship you today. So Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth, as well as the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are my strength and my redeemer, and I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On this morning, if you don't mind, I'm going to be speaking to you from the book of First. Samuel, and if you was in Bible study on Wednesday, I kind of alluded to a little bit of what we were going to be talking about today, and and it's amazing because I think I said one thing on Wednesday. Oh, we're going to talk about how uh, 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 God's love for 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 David, David's love for Jonathan, and David's mercy upon you know who was that. Uh, Miss Fivishab and all of that. God said, see, you got to talk it before I directed you. Because when I began to get into the word, the Lord took me a totally different direction when I began to read these passages of scripture, but it took a more serious tone um, when God was leading me through it. So if you will, I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel. And we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. So I told y'all on um, Wednesday night at Bible study as I was reading, you know, after we got through Bible study that when I was reading the book of 1 Samuel, I mean, the, 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 the narratives and the storyline behind the different characters 
it, it, it's, it's so amazing to see how God's hand can come in and work in somebody's life. You had um, Hannah who was went without a child, but she prayed to God and God gave her a child. But her heart was so grateful and so thankful yeah. that she promised in her praise and worship for what God had done to her that she was going to give him back to the Lord. But see, the thing that showed her heart was true is she followed through with her commitment. And she gave her son um, to, to, to the Lord. And, you know, he was taught by Eli the prophet. And I was reading that story. And then I read about Eli's sons. And them were some scoundrels, <laughs> to, to say the least. And, you know, they were doing all this abominable stuff. And taking uh, portions of the, the, the meat sacrifice and the stuff they were doing with the women who were dressing out the temple and all of this stuff was just despicable. And then along comes uh, after the death of, of, of Eli and his son Samuel, who was already being raised up, became the prophet. So here we are after... Samuel is, he's prophet now, and he's older, and here we are at chapter 8, well let me go back a little bit, because there was a part that I found interesting, and it was when Samuel was lying in bed one night, and he heard the voice of the Lord call out to him, and he, he went to Eli, first time he got up with Eli, he said, you call me, he said, no, I ain't call you. So he said, you sure about that? And no, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. So he went back to bed. He heard the call again. Yeah. And he went back. He said, did you call me? He said he did it about two or three times. But this one, the last time, Eli told him, this time when you hear that voice say, here I am, Lord. Yeah. So he, the third, the, after that time when he heard that voice, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord began to minister to him about what he had called him for and what he had a word for him to give. Yeah. Amen. And, and and it's amazing to watch how God began to use him and, 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 and rear him up yeah. in the life of a true prophet yeah. of God. And even though all that stuff was going on with Eli's son, Samuel was reared as a true man of God. Amen. So here he is and. We're in chapter 8, and the children of Israel who were already kind of falling away from, 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 from the power of God, and they fell into idolatry and began to worship things that they shouldn't and began to fall away from God. But then it got to the point as, as Samuel got older, and the children of Israel knew he was getting older, so they said to him, Samuel, we, you, you getting older. And we know your sons, because this is the funny thing about it too. Even Samuel's sons were greedy for filthy lucre. You know, these are some greedy, <laughs> greedy dudes. So they like, you know, we know you getting older, and we ain't going to depend on them. Because we know they ain't got your spirit. They ain't got your heart. So say, but they said to him, we want us a king. Now, first Samuel got angry. He said, what? Y'all want a king? So he went to God about it. But God told him, listen, hold up, Samuel. See, they ain't rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And as I begin to read that and how when Samuel went to him after God told him this and how he addressed the people, something stood out in my mind. And the Lord began to deal with me about it because when you get later into the passage and Samuel goes before the people and he says, whose ox have I stolen? Or whose donkey have I, you know, taken away? And he begins to question them, have I not been the prophet of God that I need to be to you? 
And he began to question them. And when I read that, and I don't know why God did this, but God does it the way he does. He took me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. Remember, he said an ox knows its master and a donkey its owner. But my people don't know their God. So I began to read this and the Lord began to open some stuff up to me because when I began to hear him say, now the children of Israel, whom God had done great things for, in fact, Samuel reminded them of everything that God had done. Now here they are saying, we want a king because we want to be like everybody else. I'm, I'm going to take y'all somewhere. Lord began to open me up to some stuff, and it kind of, I ain't going to say it perplexed me, but it kind of got me to thinking. And one of the things was, and I said, God, why would your children, whom you love so much, would ask for a king? You have led them through so many things. But yet they got the audacity to say they want a king. Now you and I know a king, when you have a king, that, that, that type of government is called a monarchy. You got a monarch. A man or an individual who rules over you. In fact, the definition of monarchy is monarchy is a form of government in which a person or the monarch is the head of state for life or until advocated. So he's going to be there until he steps down. But let's go back to the recognition of what they're asking for. We want to be led by men and not you. And what struck my heart particularly was when Samuel broke it down to them as to what you are real, are you really asking this? And he broke down to them, now this is how a monarchy rule will be. And they had the nerve to say, and this is how I received it in the spirit. They said to him like, so, whatever. That's what we want. We want a king so we can be like everybody else. And it struck me because I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have been everything for your people. From the beginning until now. In fact, when Samuel began to break it down, he took it back. He said, I'm going to take you back to your forefathers. And how I, God did this for them. And he did that for them. And so here you are today. You want the king. Okay, you want a king? Here's what's going to happen. He said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a king. But even your king is going to have some stuff that he has to do. You got stuff that you're going to have to do. And if both of y'all together do not act in a manner in which worships me, you still go fall. And they still was like, well, that's what we want. Now, here's what, what, what baffled me. Now, when you understand what sovereignty is, the sovereignty of God. Now, I want y'all to listen to this. It says, basically, God's sovereignty means that he is the supreme ruler who intimately and personally rules over all the affairs of the universe. So you have told God, we don't want your universal rule. We want the rule of a monarch. Of a man. See, and I thought about it because this is what, 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 what was spoken to my head and to my heart. 
I want the, uh, how would I put this? I want the person who's in charge of the neighborhood watch to be in charge of me. I don't want <laughs> the person who's in charge of the whole state. I just want the neighborhood watchman. And God is saying to them, I have done everything for you. I have fought your battles. I made ways out of no way. I have presented you with the best of who I am. And now you have the audacity to stand before me and say, you want a king. Like I said, when I read this, immediately the Lord took me to what he had showed me in Isaiah. And if you go to Isaiah chapter 5, if you remember, God said, I want to compare the children of Israel to my vineyard. And one of the statements he made in Isaiah 5, he said, and I planted my vineyard with the choices vine. What is he saying? He said, I'll put the very best in this vineyard. And then immediately the word of God speaks to me from the New Testament. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And except the vine abide in me, you don't have fellowship. So now you had the children of Israel saying to God, God, we do not want your supreme sovereign rule. But we want the rule of somebody who is subject to make mistakes. Somebody that can rule over us with an iron fist. And like I said, it perplexed me for a while, but then it began to make sense. Here's why. Because if I mess up, I got somebody to point the finger at. See, if I don't do it right, I could say it's because you told me to do it this way. So I've got the ability now to pass the buck. If I don't do things according to what you ask me to do. When God is teaching them, you have to live according to what I told you, but you have to walk by faith and not by sight. See, they want to be able to see what's coming before it gets to them so they can have faith. God said, I've already proven to you. Everything that I could possibly do for you. Amen. I've done it for your forefathers. Read, read what I did to them for them in the wilderness. Amen. Read how I delivered them from bondage when they had a ruler who insisted that he would never let the people go. And God said, I ruled you with absolute sovereignty. And love and mercy. Yeah. And now you've got the unmitigated goal. To tell me. That you want. A king. Now like I said in the beginning it bothered me. Because I'm like. What, what are they thinking? But see. <laughs> How do I put this? That illness goes back to the beginning of time. God told Adam and Eve, I'm going to give you rule over everything in this garden. You've got authority. You've got power. You've got dominion. Enjoy it. Be fruitful. Multiply. But you see that tree right there? Don't you dare 
go near. Now what they do? Just the opposite of what he told them to do. But see, this is why I said that I began to draw the similarities between what they were saying to God and what Adam and Eve did. Because the minute they messed up, first thing they do, God calls them all to the car. Adam, where are you? Hey, you do. Come here. What is going What do you mean? First, he said, where are you? He said, Lord, I'm hiding. He said, why are you hiding? I'm naked. So God calls all of them before him. Including Satan. Yep. And I can imagine he had them all lined up. He went to Adam first. Did I not tell you not to eat of that? And what's the first thing Adam do? Yeah. Uh, her. That woman you gave me. So God didn't question Adam at that point, did he? No, he steps over to Eve. Why did you do what you did? Oh, the, 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 the devil did it. The devil made me do. So God didn't even question her at that point. But he goes over to the enemy. But guess what? Notice, he didn't ask the enemy any questions. He immediately cursed him. Why? Because the enemy did what he knew he would do. The enemy standing there, he ain't had no excuse. His mouth shut. And he knew he got you. He got the man. So God began to pronounce his judgment. Went back to Adam, then went to Eve. See, the thing that the Lord showed me in this, and we're going to read the passage first, because it's going to really break down their mindset. And I want you to go with me to Second to First Samuel. And I'm going to start at verse 7. And it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. They have rejected my sovereignty. They have rejected my rule and my authority and my love and my care and my faithfulness over them. That I should not reign over them. In other words, they're saying, Lord, we got this. Let us handle it ourselves. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt. So God is saying the same stubbornness, rebellion, wickedness that was there is still in you. In fact, one point, I'm going to go back a little bit in, in 1 Samuel, um, when the Philistines uh, 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 defeated their army, what was it, 33,000? And then they thought that, okay, we're going to piecemeal the situation. What do I mean by that? We're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it's a symbol of, 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 of who we supposed to be. But here's the part that I looked at. Who brought the Ark of the Covenant back? It was two people. The two wicked sons of Eli. Brought it back and set it in the midst of the people. I imagine God was like, you think just by having that in your presence and your heart is far from me, that it's going to keep you from the evil that's going to befall you. See, we got to understand, we just can't serve, we just can't think that because we have grace, that it relinquishes us from our responsibility to serve God in spirit and in truth. What happened? The Philistines ended up taking the Ark of the Covenant. 
See, they was all jumping up and down. And woohoo! We got the ark with us now, and we got the ark. But God was like, the ark is one thing. Your heart is another. See, you thought just because you got the ark in your presence that it was going to keep you. But see, you had already relinquished authority in your mind. So he says, now therefore hearken unto their voice. How be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people and asked of him, and to the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that I shall reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war. So he's laying down. This is what a monarchy is going to do for you. You've rejected sovereignty. So now you want monarchy. But here's the part that got me. Go down to verse 19. He says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the, to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nah. But we will have a king over us. In other words, they say, Whatever. Whatever. We want the king. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. That hit me like a sack of bricks. Because God said, I did. Like I said, then he took me back to Isaiah 1. He said, I did everything for you. I've done everything for you. And what made me go to Isaiah 1 was when Samuel said, have I taken your ox? Have I taken your donkey? And Isaiah 1 talks about what? He said, world, behold this, my people. An ox doesn't know its master. And a donkey, it's on. I will guide you. And I will direct you in the all truth. Amen. Psalms 103, 1 through 4 said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, and healeth all thine diseases, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. God said, I'm all these things to my people. But yet they ain't got the sense of the dog of a donkey or an ox. Amen. Amen. Because they rebel against me every chance yeah. they yeah. can get. Yeah. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. Yeah. Number one, Father, I thank you for opening our eyes yeah. to the truth. And seeing, God, that as our absolute, as our sovereign, yes. that we have no need for any other God. Yes. We have no need yes. of anything yes. but to trust in you, yes. but to believe in you, yes. 
but to lean on you. Yes, Lord. And you said you would protect. You went as far as the saying in your word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Help us, Lord. Help us to worship you. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us not be stubborn and stick and stiff neck and rebel against your might and your power. But let us be the children, the dear children, that you have called us to be. Lord we want you as our sovereign. Lord we want you as our king. We want you to govern our lives. We want you to be in control of everything. That concerns us. And we put all our faith and our hope and our trust in you. Knowing God. That you will keep us. And you will deliver us safely. Into the arms of our Savior. As we stand before you in your kingdom. Yes. And hear the word from your own mouth. Well done. Yes, yes, yes. My good and faithful servant. So Father we worship and praise you today. And pray for your continued strength. Your continued grace. And your continued mercy. We thank you now. In Jesus precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen, saints. Let us uh, let us be encouraged. Because when I, I, I'm sorry, because I did I didn't understand when I first got into it what God was doing. But y'all remember me telling y'all a few weeks ago, and because I would always say to people, the Lord has given me a, 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 a I'm not gonna say a complete, but a good understanding. Of a lot of New Testament scripture. But I always struggled in the old. And God told me it ain't nobody's fault. But your own. Because the same scriptures that you read in the, in the same Bible that you read. Has Old and New Testament. Yeah. Just read it. And the Lord has been opening me. And the stuff I've been reading. has kind of been solidifying or amplifying. What I knew of what God has spoken in the New Testament, you can't have one without the other. And God has been proving it. So, y'all, let's continue to pray for one another. Because, you know, uh, you know, we, we can point fingers at the children of Israel all we want. But sometimes we fall into the same rut. Like I said, I've never seen so many Christians on TV, YouTube, social media complaining about this president. When God is like, I'm your sovereign, you've got nothing to complain about. Because I will bless you regardless Amen. of what's going on. I will keep you regardless of what's happening in this society. I will be there for you. Amen.